So we're, we're trying to provide value back to them in that manner. It's a lower price point. We think it's there's value in community and talking to others that want the same things and having someone to help you prevent making problems that we made. Um, at least you'll make different ones. You won't make the ones we made. And if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Conner, your host, and this is the show where we talk about getting all the money you would ever want for your real estate deals without even having to ask for money. Well, as you know, I have amazing guests here on the show where we talk with them about how they raise private money. Well, my special guest today on today's show has raised over $5 million in private money. Now, way back when he started, his very first real estate property they got started with was actually a duplex. You know the model, you live on one side, you rent out the other. Well, fast forward as of today, he has invested in over 4,000 units all across Texas, Oklahoma, Ohio, uh, Louisiana, all over the place. Well, in addition to all that experience, he's got some professional credentials. He's a MBA in finance. He's uh, also a CPA. Well, in this episode, we're going to dive deep and hear how in the world he's been so successful in this, and more importantly, why does he do this? In just a moment, you're going to meet my very special guest, Mr. Randy Langendurfer, right after this. Randy, welcome to the show. Jay, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Uh, well, you made me sound a whole lot better than I am on that intro, but uh, that was very kind of you. Absolutely. I just love sharing the experience that my amazing guests have. And I mean, you rank right up there. So I'm interested in knowing, Randy, how old were you when you did that first duplex? Yeah, my wife and I, when before we ever bought a house, that was our first uh, acquisition is we bought a duplex, as you indicated, and we're house hackers. I didn't know what the term house hack was then. But yes, uh, we bought a duplex, lived in one half, rented out the other half. And I was in my mid to late 20s. Um, and then we owned that for about four or five years. And, you know, I got real busy on raising a family and trying to climb the corporate ladder. Um, and then uh, came back to real estate later in my career, about 10 years ago. And so that's the, the real quick, uh, the down and dirty on the house hack. Man, I am jealous of you. You did it started in your mid twenties. I didn't start until I was 43 years old in this world. And just think what more we could have, I could have accomplished if I started with you. So that was your first investment. And I mean, you know, fast forward, you got over 4,000 units now. So um, tell us, tell us that story. So you did the duplex, you know, you got involved in raising the family. You've been in the corporate world. You're still in the corporate world today. And in fact, one of the conversations I want us to have is how do you, how does someone balance, you know, that full-time job while doing real estate investing as well? But take us back to actually when you really got serious about the business and, and how that grew. Well, I'm actually, uh, actually exited the corporate world about nine months ago uh, in the summer of 23 to do this full-time. But I got started, as I said, uh, because I always had real estate in my blood very early in life. And uh, I conned my wife into doing a house hack, as we said, a duplex. And it was uh, it was a wonderful experience. You know, at the time I was everything. I was the I was the leasing agent. I was the, the maintenance guy. I was the lawnmower and everything in between. And I was just forgive me, young and dumb and uh, didn't know any better or an easier way to do it. But uh uh, we ended up growing a family and quickly grew out of the duplex and had to have a house. So uh, I sold that. And like I said, I, I was absent in the real estate years for probably 20, 25 years uh, after the house hack. Like I said, raising a family, climbing the wall, climbing the ladder in corporate America and realized that uh, in, the, in the end of the day, um, 
2011 ish, 12 ish, I realized that I really needed to find another income stream. I was working for a private equity firm in the Cleveland, Ohio market, uh, where I was living at the time. And, and was it fear of being laid off, not because of any performance issues I had encountered, but just because the company was going through some challenges, financial. And the easiest way to do that is get one get rid of some of their expensive labor, uh, which was me. Luckily, it never happened. Uh, but I had a brother-in-law who got me into, at the time, the next entree into real estate was single family hard money lending. And so I started to become and became a hard money lender for living while living in Cleveland, Ohio, with a group out of Dade County, uh, Miami Beach area, flipping houses. And we were, as you would imagine, just we were the bank. We lent money, uh, oversaw the uh, acquisition, the repair budget, maintenance, blah, 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 and took a hefty uh, interest fee for doing so. And, and that was successful. Um, but I knew that wasn't going to last forever. And when I relocated to Houston for te- for business reasons, I fell upon multifamily and I learned the power of syndication and using other people's money. And you would think uh, a finance guy like me would have understood that or known that beforehand, but I'm just a little slow, Jay, and had to take a little longer to pick it up. But understanding uh, the value of syndication, other people's money. And so I've been off and running Fast forward to today, I'm a um, general partner in about 1,500 doors, and I'm a limited partner in probably 3,000, 3,500 doors. I still invest in other people's money, other people's deals, and I will as long as I'm alive because I'm all in to this asset class. Really enjoy it. So you know both sides of the desk. You have been, you are a private lender and you borrow a lot of private money through syndication. So you understand both sides. Um, So it's been my experience, Randy, that most real estate investors that get involved in private money as far as borrowing private money. There's a story. There's a pivot. There's something that happens in their uh, journey that causes them maybe out of necessity to start using other people's money, individuals, instead of the institutions and the banks. My short story is I started investing in single family houses in 2003 in Eastern North Carolina in a very, very small market, still there now today. And the very, in the first six years that we were investing, uh, everything was fantastic using the local bank institutional money. And then in January, 2009, uh, I was cut off from the banks with no notice along with the rest of the world. And so it was, that was my pivotal moment. I either had to go home with my tail between my legs and quit, where I had to find a better and quicker and easier way to fund my deals. And so out of necessity, I was forced into learning about private money and using other people's money. It was the biggest blessing in disguise in our entire journey, in our entire business. Our our business actually tripled in the midst of uh, a global financial crisis by starting to use private money in 2000 versus relying on institutional money. What's your story? What happened to where you started using private money, other people's money? Uh, great question. And uh, wow, that sounds like a one I'd like to hear a lot more about sometime because that seems like a, a good lesson learned. Um, but my, my journey was really started out of a, a very conscious effort that uh, in 2014, when I moved to Houston, Texas, I was setting myself a very deliberate pathway that in 2023, I was going to leave the corporate world. And so I needed to grow my income to support that difference. And I very consciously had that date circled. I probably could have left a lot earlier if I'd wanted to, but quite honestly, I was stubborn and had to meet that exact goal I'd set. But the impetus was, was really to grow the business for me. I had learned the model of underwriting and how to find properties and how to build teams. And I realized that if I was ever really going to grow, that I needed equity to put in deals, multifamily, you know, those deals just continue to get bigger and bigger. 
And so I, I needed equity. And, and the, very simply, it was time for me to put up or shut up. If I was going to do this, then I needed to embrace all the friends and family to start with and build from there. And so, um, you know, the first time out, 2018, my partners and I found a property in um, Beaumont, Texas. But for your listening audience, that's about 100 miles due east of Houston. And uh, we found a property that, oh, everyone would tell you not to buy. It was 132 units, uh, flat roofs, chiller boiler system built in 1965. Mm. And uh by all definitions, you wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it today, but um, we had to raise 3.2, 3.6, 3.6. And I raised 650 or 700 of that. And I was just, I was the biggest person in, in the partnership that raised the most. And uh, I was just off and running. I was, you know, how do I, how do I monetize this? How do I pro get, build a process up to build this? How do I find more investors? How do I uh, do more? Uh, because once you realize the big guys have an unlimited supply of capital because they've built up a beautiful network, then it's just finding the deals. And I think finding the deals is probably easier than raising the money. But back to your question, the impetus was me is just to grow my business. Yeah. So you you wanted to start using private money to scale your business, right? Yes. So. Uh, you've used a couple of terms that I want to make sure our listening audience understands. You okay. used the word you used the word syndication. Uh, you used the word general partner. You used the word limited partner. Define what those phrases and words mean. Yeah, so a syndication is really just um, a group of investors who pull their resources together to buy a large a large asset, a large multifamily. So a large multifamily property today, the, the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, but if the bank puts down 25 to 35 or 60 to 65 percent, you still have to raise 30 to 35 percent equity in the deal. And so let's just say uh, very simply, if it's a $10 million deal, you need to raise three and a half million dollars. Uh, at probably the least. So very few people have the ability to stroke a seven figure check. So you, you go out and you find in a syndication, you combine resources of a group of investors and those investors are called the limited partners. Uh, they have limited liability. They have actually no liability other than their investment. And the term general partners are the ones in that syndication that find the deal, uh, do all the due diligence on the deal, get the loan for the deal, find the property management company. And so they're very active in the deal where the limited partner is the one, the illustration I'm sure you've heard, Jay, is the airline, the plane, the pilot in the front of the plane is flying the plane. He's got to look at all the uh, air traffic control and the weather and what's going on outside. And he's responsible for everything. While the and he's the general partner in that illustration, while the limited partner is the passenger in the back of the uh, plane, sitting there drinking their favorite beverage, reading a book, and just relaxing and enjoying the ride. So either one works. You just got to decide which one you want to do: uh, be active slash general partner or passive slash limited partner. <clears throat> I was going to say, and you just said it: um, limited partner, aka. Passive, sit back, just get returns. And the general is the operator. They're out there making it happen. So to compare that, what you just explained in commercial or multifamily, to compare that to single family, which is primarily my world, single family houses, how we use private lenders is the real estate investor, the real the entrepreneur. We're like the general partner in a commercial right. project to where we're finding the deals, overseeing the deals, overseeing the renovation of that single family house. And then the private lender or private lenders that are funding that deal, they're totally passive. Their only interest is getting the return on that. So the difference in terms here in the world of single family, we call in, in, in uh, contrast to uh, syndication in this world of single family, we call it one-offs, one-offs. 
So uh, in the world of one-offs, where you've got a single family house, you've got that one single family home property that's being funded by a private lender or a couple of private lenders. So in your world, uh, Randy, of commercial multifamily, you're combining, okay, you're combining institutional money of about 65 or so percent of the, of the project of the deal. You're combining that with um, 35% that's coming from individuals or other people's money. So at the end of the day, and I'm tired of that phrase, but I can't think of a better way to say it. At the end of the day, private lenders are private lenders, individuals that are investing in real estate passively. It's just a matter of how the deal is being structured, right? Yeah, I mean, and it's absolutely, and it's probably just how much money the passive investor wants to put in. Um, you know, they could probably, I don't know, just depending on how big your single family fix and flips are, uh, they may be able to get in more multifamily or less, uh, but you're absolutely right. It's the ability to pool money together and you're leveraging it. That's why we all buy real estate is because you want the advantage of leverage, whether it be a bank in a multifamily or a person or persons in a single family. You're using the concept of leverage to propel your returns because you're using someone else's money. Exactly. Now, Randy, one of the most common questions I get from new real estate investors or real estate investors that have never raised private money is, where do you find these people? Where are these people that, you know, are going to invest in your deal? So I love to talk about that, but I want to hear and, and my audience wants to hear, what do you say? Where do you find these private lenders? Well, that's a that's really the challenge of what you'd call a capital raiser or somebody that's looking for capital. So in my world, I do two things. I do I find deals and I find investors, and then you try to match the two up. And so, assuming you have a deal, uh, what you do is or what I did anyhow is everybody generally starts with friends and family, and you you tell your uh, brothers, sisters, your aunts and uncles uh, that little. Uh, snot-nosed kid that they used to know uh, wants to raise uh, several million dollars to go out and buy uh, a multifamily apartment building. And they kind of look at you strange, but you uh, it's really a mindset shift. And it, it truly is. I know that's simplistic, but um, you have to get over it. And I had to get over it. I'm the most conservative of all uh, as a finance professional that doesn't like to ask people for anything, let alone money. And so you have to kind of get over it. But you start with your friends and family is the way you are. And then I um, did a lot of education of myself about how you raise money. And, you know, you start by building a list. So you have to have a list of potential investors recognizing you probably got to talk to, I'll say, 50 to get one to start out with. Um, but you talk to friends and family. Uh, you start to use Social media, by putting content out in the social medias, your LinkedIn, your Facebook, and you want to build your brand so that people see you as a thought leader. And, you know, if you get out on social media today, there's dozens and hundreds of them doing it today, giving away free information, educational material. So it takes a while to develop your sweet spot, but you're on the social media, you're trying to develop a position as a thought leader in this space. And even though you may not have a deal to start with, I started to develop what I'd call as a pitch deck. So it was a pitch deck that said, here's how multifamily works, uh, a group of investors forming a syndication. And, you know, if I can get you six to nine percent cash on cash return and potentially double your money in five years, I just simply asked, would you entertain it? Would you talk? Would you look at it? Well, anybody that's savvy would say, sure, I'd look at it. I'm not going to commit to anything, but I'll look at it. And the conversation starts there. So you start on social media, you build your pitch deck wherever you can get in front of people. Meetups, podcasts, um, any place you can talk to people at networking, commercial uh, or single family uh, conferences. It's not hard. Uh, you start to put a list together. I then started publishing a monthly newsletter 
uh, to all that list and just telling them news in the industry, in the space, so that I was perceived and growing as a as a thought leader so that you want to begin to have a relationship with investors so that when you do have a deal, you're not calling Aunt Susie and saying, hey, Aunt Susie, can you give me $50,000? Uh, you want to have a relationship, but you start with those people you know because they know you and you can convert them to thinking about other alternative assets easier than you can cold calling somebody. But the most important thing I think is getting in the concept of building a long-term relationship and providing value to them in their knowledge transition from um, neophyte to experienced and these other alternative class, be it single family or multifamily. Uh, I had a brother-in-law who first I remember approached me to do single family, hard money. And I said, you're stinking nuts. Uh, but I educated myself. And I became comfortable with the space to where I did write a check and we invested. And so um, it's a it's a long process, I think, to really become proficient at. You don't just start unless you got a lot of rich relatives raising millions of dollars. But I think you can grow it and it becomes evolutionary to where it can become something. To your audience, Jay, if I did it, anybody can do it. <laughs> well, one word that you just said in your answer was the word, and this really differentiates um, how I raise private money, how you raise it private money, in contrast to maybe some other people. And that is leading with education, leading with education. When I serving, teaching, when I first started raising private money, and I still to this day, when I'm attracting new private money, I separate the conversations with people of having a deal for them to invest in. And first of all, educating them up front. So when I was cut off from the banks back in January of 2009, I put together what I call my private lending program to where I would educate individuals, people in my own network, people that I go to church with, people mm -hmm. that are in the Rotary Club, Business Networking International, um, any of my connections. Uh, I mean, at one private lender luncheon, I raised nine hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars just by educating without having a deal. You know, what's interesting is I've never pitched a deal. Now, that the reason I've never pitched a deal is because in the world of single family, as in contrast to multifamily, it's very easy to have people understand the rate of return you're paying on deals, how they can get their money back in case of an emergency, et cetera and how they're protected. You know, we're not borrowing unsecured funds. So first of all, I teach what the program is. And then when I have a single family home for them to invest in, I don't call them up and pitch the deal or ask them if they want to do it. I give them what I call the good news phone call. I call them up. I say, look, I got great news. I can now put your money to work for you. I got a house in Newport with an after repaired value of 200,000. The funding requires 150,000. I know they got it. They already told me closing is next Wednesday. You got to wire your funds by next Tuesday. I'll have my attorney email you the wiring instructions. End of conversation. The reason that is so easy to attract the money without asking for it, particularly is if you have told them about self-directed IRAs and they never heard of self-directed IRAs and they've moved their money over. They're waiting for you to call them. You are ethically bound to put their money to work. But in contrast, but not really in contrast, as you were just saying, Randy, in multifamily family space, you educate, you lead that away. But then when you have like a deal, a larger deal, that you're raising money for, then you'll be explaining how that particular deal works. In the single family, it's like, okay, how much and when do you need it? So that's sort, you know, sort of the differences. So I'm glad you, I was just so glad to hear you say, Randy, you got the same philosophy that I do. And that is leading with education, leading with a servant's heart. You know, it's interesting to note, I have 47 private lenders right now, individuals, that are loaning money on our deals. And you know what's interesting? Not one of those private lenders have ever heard of private money or private lending or self-directed IRAs to where they can use their retirement funds 
to move over to a self-directed IRA and invest in real estate totally passively. So I led with education and therefore attracted the money without asking for money. Now, one thing that you've got, Randy, I want you to tell the audience all about. You got this thing called multifamily maestros. What <laughs> in the world? That's very intriguing. What in the world is multifamily maestros? Well, before I answer that, I will. I, I got to tell you the quick story about the, the power of the self-directed IRA, of which you know, but for your listening audience. So um, I mentioned the finance professional. And the first time a brother-in-law came to me to flip a house in South Florida and says, we need to use our, our self-directed IRAs. And, you know, for a, an educated person in the, tra in the traditional manner, that is an absolute no-no to take long-term money and invest it in what we call an alternative asset hard money in a single family or a syndication in multifamily. And uh, he told me this and I said, you're nuts. I said, you're crazy. There's no way. But once I learned one that it was totally legal, it's uh, out there for many people and people don't think they have money to invest in these things. They find they have previous employer where they can transfer the money, as you said, and put it to work, earning a much higher rate of return. And then I always try to educate and help tell them about you know, the value of diversification. I grew up the traditional approach of syndication. I mean, there are uh, equities and bonds, uh, a diversification strategy of, you know, some large cap, small cap. I always tell the story of my last employer here in Houston, Texas, uh, a large academic medical center has a billion and five. That's with a B endowment fund. And when I first got there 10 years ago, they were doing the traditional asset allocation equities, bonds, foreign, domestic, large, small cap. By the time I left, they were putting anywhere up to 12% of that 1.5 billion in commercial real estate. And so I quickly realized that a lot of these institutional investors are using that as a diversification strategy too. So once you help people understand the power of that, it's really um, interesting to see their eyes light up uh, when they get their first check. I hadn't forgot about your question, multifamily maestros. Uh, so I've had, like you, I'm sure Jay, have had the privilege of having a lot of people that have built into my real estate journey and helped me get to where I'm at today. And I'm thankful for that. I first got involved in a large institutional group in Houston, Texas called um, Lifestyles Unlimited. Uh, I then transferred to Sumrock Group in Dallas, Texas. I've also been in a Rod Khalif group. There are, to mention to your audience, there's from a multifamily perspective, there's Jake and Gino and Michael Blanc and Mark Kenny's group, all large uh, national mentoring organizations and how to learn about getting a multifamily property. They cost big money. Uh, I never went the approach of fully investing in it, but they want 25 $30,000 to get into those programs. And I was just stubborn enough to say I was going to teach myself. And I did over a longer period. I probably would have gone quicker if I'd have done it. So a colleague of mine started uh, earlier, just a couple, several months ago, started what we call the multifamily maestros. It is a mentoring slash coaching program to help people become proficient and how to acquire multifamily properties. Uh, you help people acquire single family properties. Uh, I want to help people at a much lower entry point uh, come into the multifamily space and learn about it. So we developed this program. I call it uh, the true value hardware approach. Uh, I don't know if you're a do it yourself or dog, but if you go into the what I'd call the big box like Home Depot or Lowe's, I can't ever find somebody to ask questions to or talk to. And I recently went into my true value hardware store. Uh, to find something, the project they had going on home. And the person met me at the front door and said, how can I help you? And so we just want to give a very personalized approach. Uh, it's myself and another guy. You're not going to get our underlings. You're going to get us. Uh, we're, we're starting this up. I said, we've got four students right now, but we're looking to hopefully grow that a little bit. And we've got it at a much, much lower price point. That's much more reasonable for people. And so we're, we're trying to provide value back to them in that manner. It's a lower price point. We think it's there's value in community and talking to others that want the same things and having someone to help you 
prevent making problems that we made. Um, at least you'll make different ones. You won't make the ones we made. And uh, there's just a lot of it. Yeah, so it's it's nine. It's I'm sorry. It's twelve online modules that um, you can take at your own self pace. We have weekly group coaching calls, myself and my partner, and then obviously email a support as well. But uh, we find that it uh, giving back to the community is important to us as well, and, and we're enjoying it and having fun with it right now. So we'll see where it goes. I love it, Randy. So that. URL, that website to learn about multifamily maestros with Randy is www.multifamilymaestros.com, multifamilymaestros.com. I love the maestros part, Randy. Uh, my wife, Carol Joy, and I are both musicians. We both write and compose music. Um, I, shoot, I've, I've been writing music all the way back to... Um, the 1990s when my music was in Universal Studios movies. So I love I nice. love the world. Of, so so just real quick, why do you have maestros in the multifamily maestros.com? Where does the where does the maestro come from? Uh the maestros was is it's uh, two of us and uh it's the fact that you know I look at the my, the the maestros is the kind of the director uh, and our logo it's got a multifamily with both two people on both sides of it with the conductor stick. You know, uh, and so the, in my mind, the conductor is the one that um, I'm not out there doing. I've done it. I'm not going to do it for the students, but I'm I'm directing them, yeah. calling in the trombones and I'm crawling, calling in the trumpets or, or whatever they are uh, and trying to make them harmonize together, at least in our minds. It's uh, perhaps perhaps naive, but that's that was the thought that between the two of us, uh, we could shed some value to uh, the, the students and help them propel their growth. I love it. Randy, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me here on the show. Hey, Jay, I got one other quick one for you. Anybody that wants to, if they're interested in that program, that they can, there's a discover or a contact on that multifamilymaestros.com. I want to offer your audience a, a trial 30 day period for $197. You can't beat the price. It's going to be uh, join our group calls and you have access to the first three modules. Let me know if you have an interest. That's awesome. Thank you for that gift, Randy. I really appreciate it. Hey, it's my pleasure. And thanks so much for letting me be on the show. You've got a great audience. I've been a fan from afar and uh, look forward to meeting you again one day. All right. Sounds great. Well, there you have it. Another amazing show, another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And do me a favor. You know, I want you to share this episode. If any, if this episode really made an impact on you, share this episode with someone that you know that would really like it, and I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash moneyguide that's J-C-O-N-N-E-R dot com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor dot com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay.